Hello, I'm Bonnie Watson Coleman, one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Caucus of Black Women and Girls, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this session of the National Minority Quality Forum's 2020 Summit. COVID-19 has placed a glaring spotlight on the health disparities that exist in communities of color. They are problems that we've long known about, but this virus has brought them to the fore. They are present in the rates of pre-existing conditions, the access to care, the risk presented by our neighborhood and jobs, and the treatments we're prescribed when we can see a medical provider. These disparities exist across all categories, from mental health to heart disease and certainly obesity. These disparities require a range of solutions, increasing cultural competency, finding ways to eliminate systemic racism through training and accountability, and research that is specific to and inclusive of our communities conducted by academics who are themselves people of color. It also requires expanding the range of treatment options and increasing access points to coverage. The challenge of obesity and all the comorbidities that frequently accompany it is a perfect example. And the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act is one of the solutions I am a co-sponsor of this legislation because of the potential it holds for reducing a major threat to the health for people of color by expanding Medicare coverage to include both behavioral and pharmaceutical treatments for obesity and weight management. We are targeting a frequent challenge our communities face with new solutions and additional tools to fight this particular disparity. We know that there are many factors we have to deal with in this space, socioeconomic, cultural, and even local economic development as it relates to access to grocery stores and the like. But the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act could be a powerful tool and we need all the help we can get. I know that tools like these are going to be an important part of today's discussion. And I'm sorry that I'm unable to join you for it, but I'm also very grateful for the work that you are doing to help address health disparities in obesity and across health care for all people of color. This is a moment that can be harnessed into a movement for real change, and it will take all of us to make it happen. Thank you for all that you're doing and enjoy this session. Good morning, all, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the panel on obesity in communities of color, a closer look at addressing existing disparities through education, awareness, access in the age of COVID-19. We first like to thank the Honorable Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman for her great video to help champion this Ep epidemic and this issue as something important to us. And so thank you again for um, coming this morning. And I'd like to introduce you to our panelists and I'll have them introduce themselves. And we'll start with Joe Naglowski. So good morning, I'm uh, Joe Naglowski. I am president and CEO of the Obesity Action Coalition, which is the uh, nation's uh, largest patient advocacy organization around obesity. We were actually created after a uh, member of Congress stood up at a women in government meeting and said, I'm asked every day to do something about the obesity epidemic, but it's always by someone in public health or a healthcare provider. I've actually never had someone with obesity uh, actually ask me for help. And so we were created to fill that gap uh, nearly 15 years ago and now have about 75,000 members, 90% of whom have self-identified themselves as having obesity. In addition to that, I also chair the Obesity Care Advocacy Network, which is a broad coalition of organizations that will, when we talk more about uh, access solutions later on, that I can talk to you a little bit more about their work as well. Thank you, Joe. Now, Dr. Stanford. 
Yes, hello, my name is Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. I am an obesity medicine physician scientist at Massachusetts General Hospital and at Harvard Medical School. I'm one of the first fellowship trained obesity medicine physicians in the world and really um, bring together the intersection of looking at research and its impact on communities, particularly communities of color, um, looking at issues related to policy, doing work with my friends such as Joe Naglowski um, on the Hill to address issues such as obesity through things as was mentioned by um, Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman, the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. I'm um, in through the teaching and education to my medical students residents, fellows, and junior faculty here at Harvard Medical School. My goal is to recognize obesity as a disease, to recognize the multidisciplinary care that is necessary to improve the outcomes of those that have this disease, and to take away the blame for those patients that do struggle with this disease, recognizing that its impact on the community, particularly the Black community, is paramount for us to address and to tackle with our patients in a respectful fashion. Thank you so much, and I look forward to this discussion today. Thank you, Dr. Stanford. Dr. Harvey? Hello, my name is Keisha Harvey Mansfield. I am in private practice. I am working in rural Bogalusa, Louisiana. I am also an AAFP Health Equity Fellow. And this year, my topic uh, to study for this year and also to develop a plan to tackle is uh, weight bias. Um, my program includes education patients as well as local physicians about what weight bias is. Um, also categorizing obesity as a disease that requires treatment and a partnership and relationship with your patient. Um, and also just empowering patients with non-numerical goals to help treat their obesity. Sometimes patients get so caught up in whether or not they're losing weight, which is important, but they also lose sight of some of the other goals um, like more energy, sleeping better, a reduction of their stress level. And I am very thankful for this opportunity and I look forward to having this discussion with you guys. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. As you all can see, the National Minority Quality Forum has put together an illustrious informed expert panel and I am excited to jump right in and start asking questions. And so our first question of the morning, let's start talking about social determinants of health. So how do social determinants of health impact the prevalence of obesity in communities of color? Whoever would like to jump in first. Dr. Stanford? Yeah, so um, one of the key things that I think we need to be aware of, of is the impact of issues such as racism on issues, diseases like obesity. What we do know is that obesity is an inflammatory condition. Um, if we were to measure inflammatory markers in those that have obesity, they are elevated and they can be elevated as a risk or associated with what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis if we're thinking about issues such as racism, um, which is, we know, a major issue in the fabric of our nation. Um, so it's important to recognize that external influences that can also influence our likelihood of having this disease and persisting with this chronic relapsing remitting progressive disease. A lot of people, and so this is part of that taking that blame away, you know, when we experience racism, for example, it's not something we ask for, right? It's not like, hey, that's what I want to happen today. These are things that happen as a result of just being different from, let's say, the majority population. Um, when we think about access to care, um, the ability and willingness to engage in the healthcare system, secondary to many of the atrocities that we've experienced in communities of color, if we look at things like the Henrietta Lacks experiment, if we look at Tuskegee, um, you know, we could keep going on and on. These are some of the large things that we think about, but these things show that maybe even when we do have this disease of obesity, that we don't want to access care and we may not have the resources to access care to treat this chronic disease that impacts so much of what we do in life. So that, that's where I, I think I'll get the conversation started. Um, just to add to that, um, when I think about the social determinants of health, um, I think mostly about economics and poverty. Um, in the healthcare field, if you don't have a safe place to sleep, you know, it's, it's really difficult to be concerned about what your sugar is or um, to even think about taking the time for a healthcare um, appointment. Um, if you don't have money for healthy food, you know, you're going to buy something that's a little bit cheaper, something that's a little bit, a little bit more um, easy to access. Um, in addition to that, if you have an area that's considered a place that's a food desert, 
Um, you're gonna just buy what's, whatever's at the convenience store. Something that I've noticed, especially in the rural areas, uh, there are, are a lot of Dollar Generals. And um, a few of my patients have told me like that's where they get most of their groceries. So I don't understand how you're gonna get any kind of produce <laughs> from Dollar General. Um, yeah, so having a job is important. I was telling one of my patients, um, and it, it, this was a learning experience for me, but I was telling her that I couldn't believe that she wasn't taking her medicine. And I, I was really upset that she wasn't making her appointments. And she told me that, you know, on the long list of worries that she has, her first concern is not coming to an appointment just to tackle high blood pressure. And in fact, high blood pressure was something that I diagnosed her with. She wasn't having any symptoms of it. And she didn't feel like it affected her day-to-day her day-to-day -day life and she's not thinking 30 years from now because I have high blood pressure I possibly could have a stroke she's thinking like how am I going to get through the day and so um when we think about the social determinants of health you know access to food housing um education like is our community invested in the kind of education that our teachers are giving our kids we know if our kids get an education they're more, more likely to get a better job, whether that's um, through going to college and the connections they make there, or the skills that they learn in school, or maybe take from vocational education or being an intern for someone else. Thank you, Dr. I, Harvey. I think Dr. Harvey and Dr. Stanford did a good job covering all, all the major categories. I think one I'll add is around physical activity and opportunities for physical activity. And, and you have to think about, okay, we build a sidewalk, but is, is the community safe? And do people feel comfortable in those communities and feel as if they can uh, they can engage in those activities there? Again, physical activity, just to be clear, is uh, on its own is not a solution for the obesity epidemic. It's just part part of the equation. But I think I think it's an important part as well. And I think as mentioned previously, I think this access to healthcare, and we'll talk about the specifics. Okay, once you have healthcare, uh, uh, access, you know, what additions we can make, but I, but I think there's also this fundamental issue where, where we see too many people without even health insurance to even start this basic conversation with a provider like Dr. Harvey or Dr. Stanford to, uh, to have these conversations about obesity. Amazing. Thank you all for that information. And since we jump right into the racial equity movement, um, we cannot move on without talking about how COVID-19 is also playing into the social determinants of health, playing into issues with physical activity, um, playing into food um, access, and it's um, wreaking havoc on the economics of our communities, specifically our communities of color. Can any of you um, would like to speak to that before we move on? Yes, um, you know, I've recently published several pieces um, about this, some in the lay population and Newsweek um, and Harvard Health, um, looking at issues such as food insecurity, which has reached an all time high um, in the middle of this pandemic. Families that never um, had to worry about where their next meal would come from now have to worry with the um, number of job losses that have ex been experienced, which have disproportionately impacted communities of color. Um, that's a major issue of concern. Um, what we also know and we have to talk about, we just must talk about, is the higher degree of COVID-19 and its impact on communities of color when we look at death, morbidity, mortality, for example. Um, just thinking in my own family and, and um, I guess, group of friends, you know, my parents have lost 10 of their friends to COVID-19. My best friend lost her father and one of my mentees, who's an internist, lost both parents within three weeks of each other to COVID-19. Unfortunately, the leadership of our nation has not recognized the seriousness that is this disease that is by far much more potent and much more deadly than influenza. And let's not fool ourselves. And when we look at the interrelationship with obesity, COVID-19, racism, the, inter the interwoven nature of these three different things is so pervasive. It really raises a bar that we must address in terms of looking at how this inequity will only continue to worsen if we don't take action from all different sectors, whether it be healthcare, whether it be what's happening in government at both national and local levels, what's happening at schools, faith-based communities, and I could keep going. But I think that we have to be aware, and if we are silent at this time, we can anticipate that these inequities will only continue to worsen as we move on past this pandemic into maybe something else that um, may be even worse. 
when I think of COVID-19, um, I think of everyone talking about pre-existing conditions. And um, something that a lot of people have been saying is that COVID-19 shed an even brighter light onto health disparities because minorities in particular are mostly affected by pre-existing conditions. And um, some of this is related to the quality of care they, they um, are receiving, as well as the investment in their health care. And when I think about investment, I think about um, access. Um, I also just think about what the community has access to as far as gyms, um, safe food, um, once again, housing, income, and also some of the things that are culturally going on um, because obesity itself is a risk factor for having um, a negative outcome when it comes to COVID-19. I think about the things that lead to obesity. Some of it is policy. Some of it is advertising um, to children, especially uh, sugar sweetened beverages and certain foods. And then I think about my own community as well, because in addition to healthcare disparities, I think about the investment of healthcare within ourselves. And luckily my mom, she suffered from obesity for many years. So every morning at five o'clock, we would go walking. And now even as an adult, I think exercise is important, but something that wasn't tackled is one, um, the food that we ate, which is equally um, as important as exercising. And yes, because um, we, we were someone who was, well, we were a family that was considered impoverty, impoverished. We received something called food stamps, <laughs> which is now called SNAP benefits. And with those food stamps, we wanted to make sure that they lasted for the whole month. So that, that included buying cheaper things. We didn't really understand how to buy healthy foods um, at a lower price. Like something that I'm educating my patients on now, beans are like less than $2 and you can make them last for the whole week. Um, if you just buy fruits and veg vegetables, if you stay in the produce side, um, aisle, you don't have to spend some of the, um, uh, you don't have to buy some of the more pricey health related foods. In addition to that, um, when I was young, if, if your friends saw you walking, they automatically assumed something was wrong or they automatically thought it was a joke. Mm -hmm. if, if you had a bicycle or if your family was riding a bike, they automatically assumed that you didn't have a car. So also just trying to make it cool, you know, to walk, you know, praising people who are riding their bicycles mm -hmm. as a family, um, praising families or educating families the importance of sitting at the table and having a meal instead of sitting in front of the television. Um, people, uh, families who sit at the table are more likely to be conscious of what they're eating. And also they are more likely to have some of the con um, conversations about the day-to-day -day stressors or what's happening in each, in each other's lives lives, which actually forms a community. And that's one step closer to us first looking into the family to tackle obesity, some of the social determinants of health, and also have these conversations about why certain diseases are affecting us. Um, and yes, that includes the healthcare system and also just some of the things that we're doing to ourselves are, are unconscious, unconsciously doing to ourselves. Thank you. Want it. I want to put a little uh, frame around, you know, the risk of uh, COVID and having obesity. So if, if you if you develop COVID when you have obesity, you have a 50% greater chance of dying, right? You Your chance of being hospitalized is more than 100% greater. Your chance of ending up in the ICU is around 75% greater. And, and, I, and I think when we recognize that we have higher obesity rates in communities of color. You, you see the, the reason why we're, we're so passionate about uh, addressing uh, a COVID in a different way. And I want to throw out one more topic because I, I think actually in Dr. Harvey's opening, it got me thinking about this as well, is about um, the bias that we've seen arise during COVID. And, and I think all of us joking around the, the COVID-15 or the COVID-19 pounds we've gained and, and things like that and all the memes you see out there have actually uh, ended up, um, you know, many of us have internalized that and, we, and, and it actually makes our struggle with obesity worse. And, and I, I think I, I, one thing I think that need to be very, very clear to everyone who's, who's participating today, you know, making fun of someone or stigmatizing them because of their weight does not help them lose weight. It actually causes them to gain more weight. And so, so, I, think, so I think it's important that we recognize that even, and look, I, I will admit I am one of those people who has, has gained weight during COVID as someone who's a lifelong struggler with obesity. But 
I, we don't need to joke about it, right? I, I, th I think we need to make sure that we approach this in, in a more um, evidence-based way, just like I think all of us wish we would approach uh, COVID in a more evidence-based way as well, so. I completely agree. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, Dr. Harvey also talk, touched on cultural, being around your family. Some of our, cult, being culturally competent about COVID-19 and obesity, a lot of communities of color, we, our community, we commune around food. That is a part of our culture. And so being aware of that, throwing COVID-19 in and throwing um, the inability to get out and walk, at least as the season change from summer, you see more people walking now, but as the seasons change, we have, that's going to be a challenge. And so we definitely want to keep that in mind. Um, so what's the call to action? What is the call to action um, when it comes to addressing the disparities of uh, obesity treatment and access? So I'm, I'm happy to kick off with this one. I, I think there, there are a couple things. So on a, on a personal call to action to, ev to every person, um, I think it is important that uh, you have a conversation with the, your healthcare provider about your weight. And, and simply the question is this, is your weight impacting your health? And again, it's not about some number on a scale or anything along those lines, or uh, all of us looking like men's health or women's health cover models. This is about us, you know, having the best health possible. And, and I, th I think we have to be willing and kind of work through the fear. And a lot of us have a fear about having that conversation, but actually just to, to ask that question, right? And then, of course, I think I'll let my uh, healthcare provider friends comment on this, but then we need our health, and I'll just say, and, and maybe I'll kick you off, we need our healthcare providers to be ready to have that conversation. So, yeah. And I want to add to that in having that conversation, how do you broach a conversation with a child or an adolescent? As you answer that question for health care providers, please also answer how do we speak to our children or adolescents about our um, The call to action um, is multifaceted. Um, and I believe, yes, it, be, it, it begins in the patient physician relationship, but also um, one of the first things is a patient has to one, know that obesity is a disease. Um, some of the complications of having obesity and be ready to have that conversation with you. So the first step is just asking, okay, hey, whoever, you know, whatever patient's name, how do you feel about your, um, your current weight um, or your BMI? And, you know, culturally, it's okay to be a little thicker in minority communities. And we, all, we often um, applaud women being thick what have you. And um, we want to have body positivity. We don't want to weight shame. We want to talk, teach self health care, <coughs> excuse me, and self love. But we also want to educate them on ways that they can improve their health because their BMI is a risk factor for um, further complications. Um, so that, and also having a real plan, not simply saying, I want you to exercise daily, but how often, like when you write a prescription, how often, how long are you going to do this, um, this, this uh, treatment? And when are we going to follow up to reassess? Um, something that we're doing in our office now is we just hired another ancillary staff because physician time is a big issue when it comes to treating and tackling obesity. So we hired someone and every two weeks, a patient who um, is uh, obese will receive a phone call to say, did you follow Dr. Harvey's plan? You know, are you walking at least 10 minutes per day, three times a week? Our goal is to work our way up to the uh, 150 minutes per week and also see how they're trying to incorporate more veggies into their um, diet. Also, if you want to get on the policy level, um, I think a, a fresh start is um, one, knowing who your representatives are in your community, going to the town hall meetings, you know, advocating for the safe side um, walks, advocating for a neighborhood watch, you know, advocating um, for, you know, safer communities so that you can exercise outside. Um, also advocating for better parks. You know, you're more likely to take your kid to the park if they want to go. Are there nice swing sets? Um, in some of the um, more affluent parishes, um, the fire department donated a whole fire truck. They took the engine out and, you know, they put little gears in there. So kids want to go play, you know, on this fire truck. And I, I wish, you know, other communities would have people donating these things that kids would love that they could play on. And also just not electing officials if they can't help your community be stronger and better, you know, next year, you know, um, grooming someone else who may have 
the attributes of, of, a, of a great um, representative. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. Dr. Stanford, also, can you speak to, because um, you're an academic, also speak to um, medical training education and is, is this kind of, uh, are we emphasizing obesity and the uh, health disparities in education in any way? Zero percent would be the answer to that. So, um, of course, like any researcher, I did a study, actually an international study, looking at obesity education in medical school residencies and fellowships throughout the entire world for the last 15 years to see if any country is doing a good job of educating about obesity. And the resounding answer is no. Um, so if no country is tackling our most prevalent chronic disease, learning about obesity and its treatment, we have to have a call to action of surrounding the education, not only of our physicians, which I think is our top line of who would you know, interact with patients that have obesity, but of healthcare providers um, at all different levels and domains, um, recognizing that we will need to, in order to tackle this disease that impacts over a hundred million adults and over you know, millions of children, you know, about 20% of children here in the United States that we're going to need you know, many different persons from different levels of training to tackle the disease. One thing that we have not quite captured in this discussion is also making sure that we use the range of treatment modalities that are available. Um, we've talked a lot about eating and exercise, but there are, you know, unfortunately, most diets do fail, right? And most patients have obesity when they're coming into us and have tried, at least by the time they come into me, they've tried the 30 latest diets. Um, and that may have been over the course of 20, 25 years. So if we have seen someone not responsive to lifestyle modification, we need to escalate therapy. And that's both in the pediatric and adult populations. The American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a very strong statement in October of last year, which talked about needing to consider metabolic and bariatric surgery um, as a much more readily available treatment for those adolescents um, and young people that have severe obesity. Um, we know that patients that have severe obesity, and when we're looking at it in the pediatric population versus the adult population, we have to recognize that the criteria for evaluation is exactly still the adult population. Body mass index greater than or equal to 40 or BMI greater than or equal to 35 with some type of significant obesity related disease such as um, obstructive sleep apnea or heart disease. We need to utilize that. What we do know is that only 1% of patients that meet criteria for metabolic and bariatric surgery do receive it. Um, there is a significant amount of fear amongst the patients that are most likely to receive benefit from metabolic and bariatric surgery. And along the same lines, when we look at pharmacotherapy or anti-obesity medications for the treatment of obesity, um, what we notice is only 2% of individuals that meet criteria for the utilization of those therapies get access which is very interesting because we use medications to treat all of the obesity related diseases. I mean, we use them to treat hypertension. We use them to treat diabetes readily and patients readily accept those as potential therapies. When you talk about the chronic treatment of obesity, patients often flutter with the fact that if a medication does work for their obesity, that it will be chronic need for that therapy over the life course. So we need to do better education with regard to that and make sure that our patients have access to those modalities of, of therapy that are available, that many of which we can get in generic form, for example, for pharmacotherapy and push for better access to surgical intervention for those that have severe obesity. And speaking about access, um, what does the reimbursement look like for these treatments for obesity as it you know, pertains to um, time, physician time, as Harvey, um, Dr. Harvey mentioned, or those medications, how much do those medications cost? Is there insurance coverage for these treatments? Can we speak to um, coverage and reimbursements for such treatments? I'll start, but I think Joe is like, like ready to kind of, <laughs> I see him like, you know, doing that. Um, so I'm not going to talk for too long, Joe. I try to make it concise. Um, what we do know is that if we're looking at that that bill that we've talked about, TROA, the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, one of the key tenets um, is number one, coverage of behavioral therapy. So work, for example, with a dietitian. Right now in the United States, um, dietitian visits are only covered if you already have type two diabetes. So let's think about that. So we wait until you get type two diabetes and then we cover your dietitian visit. Mm, problematic. Number two, the coverage of pharmacotherapy for the treatment of obesity 
um, is something that is a struggle for, for many communities. We do have many generic drugs available. So for example, if we look at a drug like Fentermine, which was first approved by the FDA back in 1959, that is available as a generic. Um, it does require a bit of oversight, you know, to look for things like elevated blood pressure, pulse, et cetera. Um, but what we do know is that is accessible. And for most of the drugs that I utilize, I do use the generic formulations so that it is more accessible to my patient population, a third of whom are on mass health. And for you guys that are like, what is what she talking about mass health? Mass health was the precursor to the Affordable Care Act. So Romney Care became Obamacare. And so at least a third of my patients meet that criteria. But even for my highly insured patients that are on the, the Cadillacs or Mercedes Benz of, of insurance plans, they also want to pay the lowest amount they can for their, their, their um, prescription medications. And so um, they also like the generics because it's, you know, much, not as cost prohibitive and they're able to save and retain more. Um, so if we're looking at, you know, you know, reimbursement for obesity itself, I would say that the reimbursement for the treatment of obesity has improved over time. Um, there are skills that you might have to learn in terms of adequately billing for patient visits to cover not only obesity itself, but the associated um, conditions um, that improve reimbursement rates, which really struggled, I would say, even a decade ago. Um, so that's starting to improve. I'm going to stop there and let my friends, um, Joe and Dr. Harvey come in. So I, I will say, I, th I think, uh, Dr. Stanford did a great job there with, uh, with the, with the kind of the, the outlook. I, I will say, you know, under the Affordable Care Act, arguably, uh, every, every American who has a plan should be able to, um, receive some counseling for their weight. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, because because it actually uh, intensive counseling for obesity has a B rating uh, from the United States Preventative Services Task Force, and unfortunately, um, in, too many insurers have narrowed this to you know intensive counseling being a single visit or two visits or three visits or four visits a year. When you actually, if you read the definition, intensive is more than twelve visits in a year, right? Kind of thing. I think, and, and I think Medicare interprets that from twelve to twenty six, right? So so M Medicare does a better job. Our challenge is Medicare, though, is that Medicare says, well, the only person you can see is your primary care provider. And, and the reality is, is uh, as, uh, as mentioned earlier, not all our primary care providers yet have the training or, or have brought in people on their team that have the training to do that. And so what, what we do want to see is people be able to go to, to, to specialty care and whether that is a dietitian or that is someone who is an obesity medicine specialist or a uh, endocrinologist, et cetera, kind of thing. And, and unfortunately, under Medicare, that's limited. You know, the other thing about drugs uh, and, and pharmacotherapy, uh, anti-obesity medications is, again, it is, it is currently prohibited under Medicare. So Medicare does not allow under Part D that obesity drugs be, be covered uh, because of the old um, um, Medicaid law that was passed in the 90s that was used to base uh, the Medicare Part D legislation basically as a line in it that says agents for weight loss or weight gain are excluded. You know, and, and I would argue, and, and I think, again, Dr. Harvey said this, I really appreciated her opening remarks, that actually um, we're, we're thinking about uh, obesity medications too narrowly because they're not just about weight loss, right? So obesity medications are about health improvement. And, and I would argue, and we've argued this at CMS before, that they actually can make that decision themselves to cover agents for obesity. They're not just for weight loss. So therefore that sentence shouldn't apply. And unfortunately they uh, haven't agreed and, and to, to that. And so that's one of the reasons we've introduced the Treat, Reduce, Obesity Act. And then finally, I think about 60% of people in this country have probably have access to bariatric surgery. Um, and again, um, but when they do, they're often made to jump through it a wide variety of hoops to be able to access it. And that's the other thing, you know, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, there's a stigma around obesity, but there's also a stigma about needing help for your obesity. And so there's actually a stigma about getting treatment. And actually, I'll, I'll be honest, it's my belief that insurance companies and, and, our, and our systems of payment take advantage of that, right? And actually make people feel bad about themselves as they're trying to access this and force them through a set of hoops that you would not require uh, for any other disease. And so that, that really is makes this whole picture of access why it is so difficult right now and not why we need to break the system and change the system. Uh, to make it, you know, so that, you know, in, in my belief that, you know, all the evidence-based therapies for obesity uh, should be widely covered and they should be covered in the same way you would cover something for diabetes or hypertension or cancer or some other disease. Dr. Harvey, um, with that being said, because that was lots of great information, um, 
as a family physician um, in a rural area as a solo practice um, and as a health equity fellow for the American Academy of Family Physicians, what are some of the things that you're doing as a primary care physician um, or family physician um, to address these, these kinds of access and reimbursement issues um, in your clinic? So one, I um, recently learned that we um, actually get reimbursed for obesity treatment. And the biggest um, champion for this reimbursement or the, uh, the biggest payout actually comes from Medicare. And um, I recently learned um, through being a health equity fellow wanting to tackle weight bias and actually uh, treat, uh, treat obesity. Everyone um, talks about Obamacare. You know, you have different sizes, horrible, <laughs> it's great. But something that I recently learned is that um, if a person is insured, they don't actually have to share um, do cost sharing if they come for um, preventative medicine visits. So I get nervous when I'm coding my visits. I'm in private practice, I have to make money, but I'm also in a rural area um, where people do not need the extra burden of having to pay me, you know, when they have everything else to think about. So um, when I code, sometimes I actually under code or I don't code everything because I don't want them to get a big bill from me. And so even though I was treating patients for obesity, I wasn't getting paid for it because I was worried that my patients would have a bill. And thank God that the AFP gave me this opportunity and I started researching and I learned that, hey, I'm spending at least 15 minutes talking to my patient about obesity. I'm talking to them about smoking cessation, how both are um, um, tied to one another. And then there's this wonderful code where I can get extra money for this extra 15 15 minutes that I spent. And sometimes because we are family physicians, <coughs> excuse me, um, and the reimbursement rate for us is a little less than some of this, significantly less, if we're going to be brutally honest, than some of the specialties, it's important um, that we learn practice management because we, we learn how to give this awesome care but in the end, we don't know how to get paid for it. And if a patient is coming because they, you know, with the wonderful thing about hypertension and diabetes is people see numbers and they can actually see these numbers change. And that's kind of a reward for them to do your treatment plan. With obesity, if they don't see their weight changing, they automatically assume that your treatment is not working and they, they may not adhere to what you're doing. And you also sometimes don't have adequate follow-up. Whereas if someone has well-controlled diabetes, you may see them in three months. And if someone has obesity, if you've given them a handout, follow up in three months, where after a couple of weeks, sometimes a couple of days, people are no longer invested. Um, I've started something called the Wannabe Vegan Challenge. Um, out of all the diets, um, the lifestyle medicine community would consider a whole food plant-based diet the best diet. Most people don't understand, um, a lot of people, I don't wanna say most, but in my area, uh, area, a lot of people don't understand what I mean when I say whole food plant-based. All I'm saying is eat more vegetables. You know, you don't have to give out your, give away your meat, just eat more vegetables. And when it comes to our kids, especially in rural areas, I get very nervous because I, I feel like we're placing most of the focus on medication and surgery. And I'm okay with that in adults. And I, I get that we have to find better treatments and we haven't come up with the best treatment plans for kids. Um, but if we know that the fundamental issue is that they're not moving, <coughs> excuse me, if they don't have access to food, if they don't have some of their social needs met, why is our solution a quick fix problem such as let's give them this medication? Um, I get really nervous when we start talking about because our kids are obese, they're having higher blood pressures, they're more likely to have type two diabetes in their adolescent days. Let's see if metformin works for them. You know, let's see if we can give them Victoza or Traceva. I think that's a great plan, especially when everything else that we've done has not worked to treat their obesity. But I also think that we have to realize that more than just them losing weight, them being physically active, them actually having those better foods that improves their health care and also trying to put it into our school system. So something that I love to do is talk, as you can see. And so when the schools invite me, you know, I try to speak to the principal. I try to educate the kids mm -hmm. there 
about things that they should be doing is short lived. Um, we have to have nurses in the school system. We have to have them checking in, you know, with kids about what, what are the things that are going home. We have to put nutrition on the curriculum at a very early age for children so that they can learn what food actually and really does to the body. We have to make sure that PE is um, something that all schools have. I know one time when um, funding was cut for some schools, they're like, you know, we can cut down physical education. We can cut down some of these enrichment things that kids need to become active, to also socialize with one another. Um, so those are some of the things that I think that we should be doing. Yes, we need um, to see if medication works for adolescents. Yes, we need to know about bariatric surgery, but we know what the problem is. The problem is gonna take generations to fix. It's not gonna happen overnight. We gotta get them young. Also, one last thing, um, in colleges and in vocational schools, once again, reinforce that basic nu nutrition, basic healthcare principle to the people in college so that they can also um, instill that into their children. Something that I, I have found is if you keep repeating something over and over again, for instance, you reap what you, you sow, show and prove. If we get it to the point where people understand and it's actually ingrained into their DNA that if you do these things, you're going to have a better quality of life. You know, apple a day keeps the doctor away. That's really true. Walking a day keeps the doctor away. That's really true. I think that later, maybe not 10 years from now, but maybe 20, 30 years from now, we can have a better outcome without the intervention of some of the um, more aggressive treatment. Some of the interventions I think are a good thing to learn more about. I think that's where Dr. Sanford was saying about education, both in medical school, but also it seems we need to also educate me as a primary care doctor. I also work in student health with college students. And you're right. It's the first time in life where they're making their own choices. However, it's also a great time to educate. And so I like to hear from you all about, so Finn Finn, People here. Hold on, Latasha. Do you mind if I respond um, first of all? Absolutely, to absolutely. That's what I was trying to set you up to. Yeah, you know, I got you. I got you. So first of all, I'd like to push back on several points that were raised by Dr. Harvey. First of all, we need to make sure that we're using peace people first language. You said obese. We never use the word obese. Patients with obesity. Obesity is a disease, not a characterization. So that can cause inflammation. It can promote weight bias and stigma. One of the key things that we promote is this idea of people first language. So never calling a patient obese, but rather they have the disease of obesity. If we want to characterize their obesity, maybe they have mild or moderate or severe obesity. That would be the proper terminology. Next is recognizing that, yes, we should optimize lifestyle. There is no such thing as a quick fist for the use of pharmacotherapy and or surgery. I have patients that had metabolic and bariatric surgery 20 plus years ago that are still dealing with the chronic disease of obesity. When we look at the response to surgical interventions, the most common surgery being performed in the United States today is the sleep gastrectomy. On average, people lose between 50 to 60% of their excess weight, which means that if they carry 100 pounds in excess, they still will likely have, if they're an average responder, at least 50 to 60 pounds in excess, which means they still have obesity. What we do know is that there is a change in the communication between the brain and gut that changes weight set point that is different from any modality of therapy that we have available here in the US and around the world. The problem is that what we have to know is that 60% of black women in the United States have the disease of obesity. Another 20% have overweight, which means that we have 80% of black women alone, I'm just using the demographic that I represent, have overweight and obesity. Many of these black women, especially the women that seek care in obesity medicine, are doing optimal things to address their weight from the lifestyle factors. They are buying the best foods that they can. They're thinking about processing. They're doing their trainer sessions. They're doing their Zoom workouts. They're doing all of these things. And despite these significant valiant efforts, they still struggle with obesity. It would be prudent to me as an obesity medicine physician to ensure that they have the range of therapies available to treat the severity of their disease. It's also important for me to recognize that many of these patients will need a range of therapies. For those that have the most severe obesity, they may need not only significant lifestyle modifications, they may need surgery, and then they may need medication beyond that. And a, one of the, the biggest landmark studies that I published was the use of medications as an adjunct or add-on to metabolic and bariatric surgery for those patients that still struggle with obesity. 
I have patients that present with, to me every single day that have BMIs in excess of 50 or 60 that are both children and adults. I see patients between the ages of two and 90 as someone that's internal medicine and pediatrics trained and then spent three years of my life doing a fellowship training in obesity medicine. I will not deny therapy. Now, I will maximize lifestyle. And as someone who was an athlete who was second in the state of Georgia in the 200 meters back in the 90s, I can tell you, I will talk about exercise and do all types of exercises with my patients in the office. That is great. But when these modalities of therapy fail, when we have seen that patients have reached BMIs of 60, I can guarantee you that just changing the diet and exercise alone will be insufficient to get them into a much healthier range and to move them out of severe obesity. So that's my response um, to that. So may I, I, I think this actually, this conversation is actually the classic conversation when we're talking about obesity. And that is, 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 is it, do we take a prevention approach or do we take a treatment approach with it? And, and I will be honest with you, the answer is yes to both, right? I, I think we cannot solve this problem uh, only with prevention, nor can we solve this problem only with treatment. I, I think we need a, a solid combination of, of, of both uh, as we look forward to, to uh, developing uh, these, these systems. I think one of the things we have to acknowledge is that uh, in adolescence, uh, specifically uh, where Dr. Harvey started, we don't have great uh, treatment options right now. We need more treatment options. We need more investigation here. We have uh, some recent data from the AAP about bariatric surgery, but not a lot of great data in the middle, right? Some from, from lifestyle and we have bariatric surgery. We don't have a lot of good data in the middle and we're working on that, right? And we'll see, see what that looks like uh, moving forward. I, th I think the other interesting, and this is the analogy I draw when we, we talk about prevention and treatment and obesity is, and let's, let's apply this to a different condition. So. I live in Florida and because I live in Florida, I have to wear sunscreen every day to prevent skin cancer, right? So I wear my sunscreen every day, but then I develop skin cancer and my doctor actually tells me to still wear sunscreen every day, but they do something different, right? They add something on top of it. So sometimes my worry with people with obesity, we say, hey, change your diet and your exercise. And we keep telling them that and we don't do anything different, right? And so that's somewhat of the argument for treatment but it still includes that prevention because that diet and exercise is, is, is the core of what we do and what we need to do uh, to, to be able to address this. And I, and I think that's why actually even the, you know, the legislation um, that we've been talking about today, Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, that actually counseling for obesity is actually considered a preventative service measure, right? It, it is a combination. It is actually the kind of the perfect measure, right? It combines, let's do this to prevent you from gain, re, gaining weight and also ideally maybe help you lose a little bit of weight as well through that counseling in a healthcare provider's office. So. Thank you, Joe. That was perfect. That was perfect. That was the perfect segue to the next question was, so prevention doesn't get covered. There's not enough reimbursement for prevention. There's not enough reimbursement for actual treatment. So where do our Congress representatives and our local and state governments, where do they come into play in getting a call to action around getting um, these type of this type of care covered. What needs to happen? Yeah, so I, I think I think there are a lot of opportunities. So at, at, at the federal level, we, we, we've said this already, but I, I just want to put it out there. So the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, which would improve coverage under Medicare, specifically that counseling we talked about, that's both a preventative service and a treatment service, as well as the, as the medications. That that needs to be that needs to be passed, and if we can't pass that now during this time where we recognize that you know COVID has such an effect on people with obesity as well, you know it's it's time now for that to pass. It's basically time for Troa, is what I'm saying. And so we have about 168 members of the House um, and 17 members of the Senate who have supported that so far. And uh, you know, unfortunately, we've heard the news that the um, COVID relief package isn't going through. And it was our hope to insert that in there and actually get that passed and move forward. So, so we'll, we'll look for another instrument, but if, if you haven't written to your elected officials about that bill, it is, it is time to do so. Um, and we appreciate you know, about that half of the Congressional Black Caucus and about half of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus are, are already uh, co-sponsors of that legislation. Um, so we, we would urge you to write that. I think there's also an opportunity in Medicaid I, I think, you know, we actually have a, a, a bill that passed in Pennsylvania that would add obesity medications to Medicaid. Our challenge is, is then the state says, well, that's going to cost $100 million. And, 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 you know, it's, or actually, I think they said $86 million. I don't want to exaggerate. And, 
the, the reality is we don't spend $86 million across all the Medicaid programs in the United States about uh, for obesity drugs. How is one state going to cost that right kind of thing? And, and that's we, we have to help better under, make our elected officials understand that, again, these are modestly used and, and will be used only in appropriate patients uh, by skilled providers. Right. They're not they're not for everybody. And um, um, and although I think they should be used more often, they need to be used in the hands of skilled providers and the right patients. And so I, I think there's a call to action there. And then the final one I'll make is, you know, a lot of us live in a world where our employers control our health care. And the reality is, is you need to reach out to your employer through HR and say, do we cover obesity care services? And if not, why not? And what do we need to do to add that? And especially if you're at a medical institution, I know, uh, you know, my, my three fellow panelists are at medical institutions. Is your medical institution actually doing this, you know, kind of thing? Because it, it, it really is a tragedy, in my opinion, when a medical institution doesn't cover obesity care for its own employees. Thank you. So I am, we have a lot of questions that are pending in our question and answer box. So I'm gonna, uh, going to pivot to our audience now, okay? And so one question um, that we have is there have been great changes in public health space, such as healthier food packages and WIC and being associated with lower obesity for two to four year olds, um, healthy school lunches, population health efforts. Um, how, how do we continue to have these discussions with uh, policymakers? How do we, even they're making some changes, but how do we influence um, and policymakers to, to continue to make these changes for our children? Well, so, um, sorry, Dr. Harvey, go ahead, please. So. I think something that's important is first that we get introduced to our policymakers and actually know what policies they're um, pushing forward for um, that are actually going to affect our lives. I think that's something that's important in the um, in schools currently is also making sure that when they do have these vending machines that they off they offer um, healthier snacks. In addition to that, trying to take sugar sweetened beverages such as sodas, sweet teas, even power aids um, out of school uh, systems. <coughs> excuse me, and offering some of the better choices for beverages um, between classes. Yeah, and again, I, I think to our earlier conversation, this balance between prevention and treatment, one have, I, I think there's great opportunity to actually have a conversation about to your elected officials about, so, so what are your views around the prevention of obesity? And then what are views around treatment of obesity and, and find the avenues where there are opportunities. And I, I think the, uh, uh, the example raised by uh, Daphne who asked that question are, are perfect, right? We, we have to create a system where the healthy choice is the easy choice. We're um, in order to, and you can think about that in two ways, right? Because we, we do have a hundred million Americans affected by obesity now. And so uh, treating them all is probably an unrealistic goal in the short term. But also, even if we do treat uh, people, we need to help that return them to the opportunity where the healthy choice is the easier choice, right? Kind of thing. And making sure the system allows for that is important. I, I will say that I, I think, you know, one of our, one of our realistic challenges has been, you know, under the current administration, we were making a lot of progress, especially on kind of these public health efforts uh, on, under the Obama administration on, and under the leadership of the first lady. And, and I think we've, we've lost a little bit of momentum. So we'll see how, uh, how things play out moving forward. But I, but I think it is, again, time to commit to both, you know, addressing obesity, which is both tackling prevention and, and treatment. Can I add one more thing to that? Um, something else that I think is, <coughs> excuse me, important when um, tackling some of these issues and um, getting through to our policymakers is also trying to um, cover the foods that we eat or the food that's foods that our kids eat while they're actually at school. I know um, where I'm from, um, grits, eggs, and bacon you know, were like the standard breakfast at school. Also making sure that while they're at school, they're getting their servings of veggies. So Dr. Stanford, there's a question about pipeline. Is there, because uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Naglowski mentioned skilled providers. So can we speak to the pipeline of, you know, education about the, in medicine and, um, and healthcare uh, train, being trained to be able to actually take, you know, learn dietitian, um, dietary skills, learn nutrition skills, and even learn the science that you have been um, providing us um, in, in the pipeline? Are we, are we training our students or should we be? 
So I think we should be, obviously. And I think that should happen across all, um, I think, um, you know, we saw Donnie John ask a question specifically related to this across nursing and dietetics. Um, you know, physicians, you know, we are struggling in terms of educating only 50 of us are fellowship trained in obesity in the country. Um, there, we do have a push from the American Board of Obesity Medicine to at least provide CME credits for people to become board certified in obesity medicine. And we now have over 4,000 doctors that are, are board certified in obesity medicine, people that are taking kind of um, efforts into their own hands to be better educated. So that's one thing. If we're looking at what's happening in the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, what we see is that there is particular training specifically surrounding weight management. I oversee um, and serve as the keynote speaker for all of the pediatric content for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics surrounding overweight and obesity. Um, there is an adult program. So these programs are specifically targeted so that dietitians can get a certificate um, that they have completed training in weight management. It is incumbent upon the dietitian themselves to do such additional training. It is not integrated within their typical um, range of modality of therapies to particularly understand the disease of obesity and how to best address it with regards to sustainable changes in the dietetic course. Um, nursing and PA schools um, still struggle significantly. There aren't um, specific um, programs set aside. Many um, people that are nurses or nurse practitioners that do want to get additional um, education can do that through groups such as the Obesity Society, the Obesity Medicine Association, where there are courses that they can take to educate themselves. But if there's a common thread amongst everything that I've said is that people are having to take additional efforts, that it's not interwoven into the fabric of medicine, nursing, PA school, dietetics, to know about the disease of obesity, to understand how the hypothalamus regulates control between adipose or fat tissue, um, and organs um, such as the large intestine, small intestine, pancreas, and stomach, ghrelin and its influence on um, eating habits is, is important for us to know. So I would say that we are not doing a job. Another question that was asked as a secondary thing was what can HBCUs do? I think this is a particular time when HBCUs can position themselves to be um, educators that really incorporate this type of information into their curriculum since these people will typically go out and service communities that look more like them um, from all different facets, whether these people pursue degrees in, in medicine or nursing or you know, to be dietitians or whatever it might be. So there's a lot of work that can be done. Um, we are so far from even scratching the surface of doing a good job in this space. So it sounds like an area for growth, for pipeline growth, where there's a fellowship a nursing fellowship, medicine fellowship, dietetics fellowship, um, we, there needs to be some programming set up, it sounds like. So that was a great question. Um, the next question that I think we should answer live is what do we do as consumers slash patients to ensure education access to the full spectrum of interventions of obesity, including coverage of anti-obesity medications? So I'll, 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 I'll take that one. I, I, th I think the reality is, is we, we, as patients, we have to demand coverage, right? Just, and we have to speak up and we have, we have to be willing to talk about the barriers we face in trying to access these therapies. And, and I realize this is a highly stigmatized condition uh, living with obesity, and it's even probably more stigmatized to, to be known that you're asking for help, but, but we do need more people to speak up. Um, and, and I do think many of the things we've already talked about already, you know, talking to your employer, talking to your elected officials, letting them know that, hey, it's not okay that we exclude these things. We can, we can talk about, you know, obesity be, being another of the pandemics that we're, we're facing in this world right now. Um, but, you know, we, we've got to create the same kind of momentum and, and activity around it. We've got to get past the stigma. And, 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 I, and I think that, that is that. I, I, th I think the other thing is, is simply, you know, as we as you talked about the pipeline of providers coming in until until patients start asking their healthcare providers about uh, their weight, um, the providers aren't likely going to go get that training. So, I mean, I think as, as you as a provider, if you get asked enough questions about something, you're going to go research it, right, kind of thing. And so, we really do need uh, people to start uh, speaking up about that. And OEC, of course, we run uh, public service announcements all throughout the United States that are, you know, go talk to your healthcare providers called our Your Weight Matters campaign that actually gives you a list of questions to ask your healthcare provider with the goal of being that. Hopefully we get the patient gets the right answers, but if not, does it at least get the healthcare provider thinking about this and, and going forward and, and, and finding the necessary training they need to be effective? To add to that question, you mentioned uh, stigma. So 
there is stigma, but how do we get past the stigma? How how do we get how do we address the stigma? Like if you say fin fin, some patients react, some doctors right. react. So right. how do we get past that? So I think when you come to when it comes to stigma, first of all, as a provider, my my advice to you uh, on all of your uh, intake forms is to say, you know, is it okay that we talk about your weight today, right? Kind of thing, and and you actually ask permission. So ask permission to have that conversation. And by the way, if the patient says no, all you can say is, hey, next time if if you want to have this conversation about your weight, um, you know, this this is a safe place to have that conversation. And guess what? I think most of the time the patient will be able to to to, to move forward. You know, the, the, the stigma part, you know, we really, you know, when it comes to the medications, we're only going to overcome as more and more people become open with the fact that they use medications, right? So I, I use obesity medications, right? And, and, and the reality is, is that they are not a miracle pill. They didn't suddenly make me lose weight. Um, curiously, what they did is made it so that I actually could comply with the lifestyle uh, modifications my provider suggested to me, right? They made it just this much easier. Easier. It was just unconscious the way it did it. Um, and so I had a sandwich. I ate three quarters of the sandwich instead of eating the whole sandwich, right? And it was completely unconscious. It wasn't, I didn't feel as if I had to make a choice uh, to do that. And, and, it, and it just made it easier to move forward. And so, so we need more people talking about their, their experiences. And, and we need to change the way people think about success and failure. And we've talked about that a little bit earlier around this. And, and so first of all, I wanna be very clear, no patient fails a diet, a drug therapy or surgery. The surgery, the diet or the drug therapy fails them, right? We, we need to stop putting the blame. We don't tell a patient, hey, that diabetes medication didn't work, you're a failure, right? Because that's your fault, it didn't work. No, you switch them to a different medication or you switch them to a different therapy, we use cancer as well. We don't, we don't ever say the patient failed. And so I, I think us changing some of this language and, and, and changing the way we approach this and so, okay, I gave them a diet plan, it, did, it didn't work out. Okay, I, 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 you know, they made an effort, Let, let's move on to something else and not, not kind of diagnose or try to blame the patient for um, them not being successful with whatever that initial option was. In, in addition to that, I think um, um, providers also need to be educated on the difference between FinFin and Fentamine and patient outcomes. I think a lot of providers are afraid that if they give them their patient this medication, their patient's blood pressure is going to go up or they're going to have a heart attack. The only reason I can say that is because when I was a resident, I thought that you had to have a special license for it. And I thought that they had to jump through all these hurdles um, to get it. And also just educating the patient on what Fentamine is, what it does, um, the side effects of Fentamine versus the side effects of the re regular medications that they take daily. And um, something that I want to just keep resounding is there's so much benefit in non-numerical goals, feeling better, better, better mental health, sleeping better, and also not just looking at the weight. But also, are your parents, uh, is, are their lip panels getting better? Did, you know, did their hemoglobin A1C get better despite, you know, um, their, their, them not losing much weight? Fentramine can actually help them do this, but also um, education. Uh, Accountability, accountability programs, one of the best programs in this country, and I hope I'm not doing a plug and I hope it's allowed, is Weight Watchers. And, um, and it also has been found um, that a lot of, a, a significant number of people lose weight with this program and doesn't um, entail any specific, um, I guess, aggressive, aggressive intervention. It just entails accountability, people writing down what they eat, actually seeing what they're putting in their, into their body and how much, and just seeing the, um, having the support group of people saying that you can do it too, and this is the way that I've done it. Dr. Stanford, she mentioned, uh, Dr. Harvey just mentioned like more aggressive treatments, and people usually, just like when they hear fin, fin some people kind of tense up when they hear about surgeries or they hear about other aggressive uh, treatments. How do we address the stigma around that? And how do we, um, what's the best way to get people educated about those options as real options? You know, a lot of it I think is educating, you know, our docs. The docs are kind of the first line here. The reason why I give, you know, over 80 lectures per year, um, likely is secondary to the fact that I want docs to be educated and I want the community to be educated because I think it, it has to come from both direct directions. I think this is one of the things that Joe was mentioning. Um, in addition, you know, when I think about how I interact with my patients, um, you know, when I start a new patient appointment, I do spend the first 10 minutes just educating them about obesity as a disease. 
And explaining that then helps them understand how we begin to navigate whatever treatment modality that we entertain. Now, their initial visit with me in obesity medicine is an hour long visit because obesity is so complex. And there's so many portions of what's happened in their family history, what's happened in their life that I need to ascertain to really do a deep dive into what's caused, what's the etiology of their obesity. Is it genetic? Important to recognize. And one of my favorite people who's not here today, Ted Pyle says, weight is more heritable than height. We have to know that weight is more heritable than height, which means that if you have parents that have the disease of obesity, there's a 50 to 85% likelihood that you will have obesity, even if we optimize breastfeeding, getting you exercising as soon as you can, giving you pureed, pureed organic foods from Whole Foods, if you want to throw out that. Um, despite all of those things, that's the prevalence. And we've seen studies by just modifying parents' preconception, how that has a huge impact on the out, their, their offspring. So there was a great study that I, I would be remiss not to bring up when I, when I make that comment, where they compared children born to a mom, mom and dad pairs. So these were the same mom and dad. Um, they had a child before the mom had bariatric surgery and then a child after. So we didn't change genetics, same mom and dad. In those children that were born after the mom had surgery, there was a three-fold decrease in severe obesity in the child born after. They studied these kids for 20 years. There was improved ghrelin levels. Ghrelin stimulates hormone. There was improved leptin levels. Their lipid and profile improved by, or it was improved by over eight-fold difference. The likelihood of having a baby born with macrosomia, which means a large body, was reduced by eight-fold. So it shows that just modifying parents prior to conception has a huge impact on their offspring. I can't change the genetic history. If all different family members have all had severe obesity, I cannot per se modify that, but I can modify the intrauterine environment by which that child is being conceived by maximizing um, response to um, different therapies for the mom preconception. We've also seen some studies with fathers um, looking at the sperm of men that have had bariatric surgery versus those have not. There are epigenetic markers actually on the sperm that predispose to higher likelihood of obesity in the actual sperm that are modified one year later. That was a study that came out of England. So, I mean, there's so much for us to learn. Even the bacteria in the gut of individuals that have obesity differs from those that are lean. So much that we're doing studies here at Mass Journal where we're taking basically that lean gut microbiota out of those that are lean and placing in those that have obesity and seeing weight shifts with not modifying anything else. So it shows the complexity of this disease and how we have to tackle it at all angles and how we have to be like sponges, consistently learning what's the newest thing, what do we learn about our bodies and how our body regulate weight. And we have to be um, open and receptive, so receptive to the likelihood that something else may come out today that we learn about our bodies. Um, and that needs to permeate what we're doing for our patients. So the message, obesity is a chronic medical issue. When you think of diabetes and cardiovascular risk factors and, you know, uh, lung cancer, you think chronic medical issue. Obesity is a chronic medical issue with physio pathophysiology connected to it that's genetic. So just like you think of diabetes as genetic, think of obesity the same way is the message. We have one more question and then we're gonna have you all give some closing statements. So if one of you will take this real quickly, the question was, how do we, it is taking it back culturally, how do we reshape the perception of weight in our community so that individuals know what a healthy weight is for them? Anybody can answer that quickly? No? So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with this. I, I, I do think, you know, our obsession with body mass index has, has been uh, this. Now, body mass index is a great thing when we're going to do an epidemiological study and, you know, one of you is going to study thousands or tens of thousands of people. It's, it is not so great on an individual basis. And so I, I really think when we have this conversation about weight and then particularly obesity, I mean, someone doesn't have obesity in my mind until their weight is impacting their health. And, and I, so I think this, this is the conversation we need to have that all of our conversations about weight are, are simply about 
whether this is affecting your health. It's not about mm -hmm. your, you know, you can have a higher BMI and, mm -hmm. and probably not have obesity. And so if we can, if we can recognize that like, we need to take away this culture, in fact, where we try to diagnose ourselves as individuals mm -hmm. with a weight problem, instead of actually, you know, letting this conversation be something that helps happens in, in the healthcare community. I, th I think that would be a good start. I, I do think, and again, I, I recognize for epidemiological reasons, we need BMI, but I think BMI has actually created most of the confusion that we see here and actually made it very difficult to, uh, to respond to, the, to this question that was asked. So. In addition to what Joe said, I um, did a published a study that came out in the Mayo Clinic proceedings last year, um, where I looked at the major racial and ethnic groups here in the United States um, in, in Haines, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, and actually redrew the BMI lines. Um, what was interesting is for Black women, universally, the BMI cutoff actually went up to 31, somewhere between 31 to 33. Um, for men, both white men, Black men, um, Hispanic men, the BMI cutoff actually goes down to between 26 and 28 mm. when you actually look at the current data. Keep in mind that the BMI charts were developed um, quite a time, some time ago, not based upon the current data and the heterogeneity of our population. And so that was part of the goal, at least in capturing it from an epidemiologic perspective. A key thing that I do not give with my patients, and they can tell you, and I have thousands of them, I do not give them a target weight. They always come in and they ask me, what is that target weight? And I will evade the question or blatantly just not answer the question. I tell them they are the answer key to my question. Mm -hmm. I know that they have this disease. They've given me information about what the causes are. We are going to investigate treatments, but their response will be governed by how their individual body responds. Um, I think that's important to note, to not compare yourself to any individual, no matter what therapy that you get. Do not say, well, this person lost this or this person lost this. This is not, this is not a competition about who lost what. It's about finding out how you get to you to your happiest, healthiest self. So we are now down to three minutes. Um, I, so 45 seconds apiece. What is your last wrap up comment that you'd like to leave our webinar audience with? 45 seconds. Go, Dr. Harvey. Um, I just want to say the answer is within you. Um, I'm glad that you attended uh, this panel. Um, so you're, you're gonna have better information to take with your physician. When you go into that uh, appointment, your biggest advocate is you. Um, let them know what you've learned about obesity. Let them know the different modal modalities that you would like to try. And also just know, even if you only lost 5% of your body weight, there are significant long-term health benefits from losing 5% versus reaching your ideal body weight and just always body pos positivity. Mr. Leglowski. So I, I think my final message is that the time for TROA is now. So go go ahead and contact your legislator, urge them to do this. We, we need to make sure that we can set up a system where uh, people have access to treatment. And, and one slight correction from a comment I made earlier, I said it passed in PA. It passed the House in PA, the Medicaid bill I was talking about. And, and actually through some education, we've convinced them to lower that uh, that that budget score to $8.6 million, which is still ridiculous, but is lower than the 88.6 million we did before, so. Dr. Stanford? Yes, obesity is a chronic relapsing remitting and progressive disease that require all modalities of therapy available in all sectors to be involved in really making um, any impact on changing this disease. We must be open-minded and receptive to both preventative and um, treatment measures to ensure the health of our entire population here in the United States and abroad. Excellent. More than 93 million Americans um, of all ages are affected by obesity. And like our illustrious panel just told you, there's prevention, there are interventions, there is work that needs to be done, there's an action that needs to be TROA. We need to get it um, passed and we need to go to our legislators. I'd like to thank you all for being a part of this panel. Mr. Joe Naglowski, Dr. Keisha Harvey, Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford, your information and your expertise is immeasurable. And we like really, really appreciate you spending time with us. And we hope to hear from you again. And we will look and look out for you in the work that you're doing in obesity. Thank you for all that you do. And um, again, this was excellent. I am floored by your, your, your ability to, to teach us more and more about obesity. Thank you. Thank you.